Okay, getting ready for the final talk of the sessions here in this room. Don't we all love tips and tricks? So this will be an hour of fun, I guess. We have Paul Norman and Jochen Topf who will be talking about this exciting topic. Here's first Jochen. Thank you. Um, we'll see how exciting it's going to get. Uh, um, so I'm going to talk about OSM to PG SQL. Who of you have been using, uh, have used OSM to PG SQL before? Uh, most people. Okay. Um, so the first slides are probably not for you. You'll you'll know these things. So OSM to PG SQL is used to import OSM data into a Postgres um, QL PostGIS database and uh, keep it up to date there. PostgreSQL is an SQL database. Uh, I think the the, the best um, uh, open source database uh, uh, around, um, SQL database around, and PostGIS is a plugin for Postgres that adds functionality that has something to the geo. So um, their objects can have um, uh, geo um, uh, types uh, like lines and polygons and these kind of things, and there's functions to work with that. And um, PostgreSQL and Postgres, this combination gives us access to a huge ecosystem um, of GIS tools, so ge geographical information system tools that do all sorts of things with geographical data. And that's why OSM to PG SQL is interesting because it gives us access to all, all of these things. Um, OSM to PG SQL is part of many mapping tool chains. Many maps you see out there are, um, there is OSM to PG SQL involved in some place. So the uh, OpenStreetMap Cardo map that you know and love from uh, um, OSM.org um, here, that there is OSM to PG SQL in the back there. Uh, or another example that um, picked randomly basically is uh, Open Railway map. They also use OSM to PG SQL to generate those special railway maps. Um, or Open Camping Map, for instance. Um, and um, they're all using OpenStreetMap data in various ways. Open Camping Map does a lot of um, specialized processing, so it figures out, okay, there, there's a polygon, um, maybe a multi-polygon with a, with a camp of a, of a campsite, and in there somewhere, there's a toilet, a, 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 a point that is tagged as a toilet, so it figured out, okay, this um, camping site has toilets, and then, um, you'll see it in, in, in those icons at the top. Um, it, it'll sh show them. and it, it, it doesn't matter whether it's a tagged on this extra node or whether it's um, on the relation that is the whole camping map. And it does all these kind of processing using OSM to PG SQL um, to, to tease out all the data that's in OpenStreetMap to create the specialized map. And this is a vector map that I created myself. I'll, I'll talk about that later a bit. Um, but it's not only for creating maps. Um, the nominatum search, the search that you uh, use when you go on the OpenStreetMap uh, website, um, also uses OSM to do SQL behind the scenes. It does a whole lot more processing on top of that, uh, but again, it uses um, uh, use that. So you can build raster maps, you can build vector maps, you can create maps for QGIS, for instance, a very, very popular tool in, in the GIS world or run some special spatial and analytics and, and all that. You, and it can also export to lots of other for, formats. Um, basically, any format that's out there is supported by po the uh, Postgres, PostGIS combination. And there's other tools to do that. Then. Okay. Um, the project started in 2006. I um, wasn't working on that then. I've, I've only been working on that for three, four years now or so. So there's a um, um, uh, several developers over the time who've, uh, who've, who've built OSM to PG SQL and, and, and improved it. Or originally written in C, now it's C++. Um, and with this long history, uh, there comes a lot of baggage. Uh, a lot of people, as I said, are using OSM to PG SQL for their maps and we can't break that. So um, we are very conscious about uh, keeping compatible to um, all these old users um, while still um, creating new ways um, uh, to to work with um, with uh, and, and with OSM data and and, and uh, allow that in OSM to PG SQLs. It runs on Linux and Windows and Mac OS. Um, you can transform project uh, geometries to any projection. There was in the last talk there was a question about that. People want that, yes. Um, and it makes sure geometries are valid. That's always also a connection point. If you get invalid geometries, then they don't render properly. Um, OSM to PG SQL makes sure that they are valid. Um, and it scales from, you can install it on your laptop and just uh, import uh, a small country or something, or you can install it on a server and 
have the whole planet um, in your database, and that just works. Um, and as I said, it can keep uh, OSM data up to date. It's not a, just one-time import, but you can update the data from minutely changes. Um, and it be has become over time more and more flexible in the data structure that you can get in the database. So you have a lot of ways of influencing what exactly, which data tur turns up in the database in which form, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, just a few, sort of, get, to get you an idea about the performance, um, Installing, uh, uh, importing uh, the whole of Belgium uh, took about nine minutes on my laptop and about six minutes on a, on on some server. Uh, that's not a, uh, a hugely powerful server. So that's totally something that you can easily do. Um, to import a planet, six to ten hours, depending on what exact configuration and 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 all of that. So that's a sort of um, uh, a rule of thumb there. Um, another rule of thumb, so how much, how big is my, my database going to be? Um, you take the PDF file that you get from OSM or some extract that you download from Geofabric or something, and you multiply that by 10. That gives you database size. It's very rough. It's, if, if the database doesn't have to be updated, it will be smaller. So it's more like eight times the PBF, and if, uh, it's more like 12 times the PBF size about that um, if you wanted to have it updatable. So, um, uh, and again, depends on your configuration. Um, so um, first tip here, um, there's a lot of outdated information about OSM to PG SQL out there. Lots of people who have tried it 10 years ago and figured out some trick how to do it faster or whatever, and most of them are not valid anymore. Look at the manual that we have on OSM to PG SQL.org website. Um, it has information about how to tune your database and how uh, roughly how big the database is going to be and these kind of things. Um, that, that should be your first um, uh, first place to look for. Um, if you can, you can pre-filter your data and it will be much, much faster. So if you want to do something like the railway map that I showed before and you don't need updating, um, you can do pre-filtering um, uh, with Osmium, for instance. You filter the data and then it only takes a few seconds to only import the railway data or whatever it is or your power lines or the points of interest that you're interested in and all that. It just take, it takes a few seconds to import that in the database if you don't need all this other stuff. Um, and uh, always try to use newer version of OSM2 PGSQL. Yes, we want to be compatible, but um, newer versions tend to be of much, much faster and sometimes orders of magnitude faster than older versions. Um, um, if you can, for instance, use from Debian backpost, it's really good to keep up with new versions, um, usually within 10 days um, of a release. Um, that They'll have that in, in, in backports, and um, uh, that that's probably going to be much better, those versions you get, than a uh, two-year-old Ubuntu version or something. Um, also, use newer version of Postgres, uh, QL, PostGIS combination. Um, we're currently on version 16. Last year, version 15 was released, um, and which had some major updates um, around index processing, uh, which uh, meant uh, um, OSM uh, to PG PGS scale imports would uh, are sometimes um, uh, several hours faster, um, depending on your your configuration, and all that. So it's it's important to keep keep up there. Um, we're not only looking at um, performance, of course, there's lots of other stuff where, that we're building. One thing which is a real reason, uh, reasonably new addition in version 1.9 uh, is we are storing now in the OSM to PG SQL uh, properties table in the database some of the configuration options that you give on the command line and some other sort of meta information. Um, so nowadays, if you do updates, you don't need to specify all these configuration anymore. So you do it once on import, and then you just say, do an update, and I'll just do it. And um, you don't have to remember uh, uh, stuff that um, exactly what options you needed or something, where your config file is, and, and these kind of things. It makes it much easier to work um, with uh, OSM to PG SQL. Um, here, just a um, uh, reminder, we, we've got a website um, which has uh, a manual, and it has examples of configurations for different use cases and there's news on there and all that so um uh, go there if you have any questions any problems and all that and it'll, it'll guide you um and we have a, a fairly extensive manual that um that ex explains a lot about all the details and configuration and all that so one of those details is um 
when we think about what we're doing here, we have the OSM data on the left side, um, and we want to import it in the, into the database on the right side. Um, and there's many, many ways of doing that. We are not just not importing everything. We decide while we are importing what is important for our use case, what are we importing, in, in what format, in what tables, what columns do we want in those tables. And there's many, many ways of doing that. Um, and there's uh, two, um, two, two sort of uh, uh, things, uh, two, two outputs that sort of decide um, which type of config file we're using. There's the old one, the PGSQL output, which is the old, more inflexible one, and there's the new flex output, which is named because it's more flexible. Um, so many, many maps still use the old one, and that's okay. Um, we'll support that as long as we have to. Uh, we don't want to support it forever, but um, we'll see how that goes. Um, and uh, But if you want to do any new stuff, use the new flex output, um, and um, you get a lot more options there, and all the new features will only be available in that flex output. Um, to support um, updates, uh, we also need to store the raw OSM data somewhere. Um, so for the import process and then for later for the updates, we need to need the raw OSM data or a part of the raw OSM data. We can store it in RAM um, and or we can store it in the database. Um, it will be faster in RAM, um, but you can't do updates then. And if you um, need updates, you have to store it in the database. Um, so this raw stamp data is the raw tags, the information that this node is in this way and this uh, way is a member of that relation and these kind of information. Um, that's what I mean with raw data. And there's these two raw data storage things. We call it the middle because it's kind of in the middle between the input and the output. Um, there's a RAM one, which is fast. The database one, which is slower because it has to go on disk. Um, the, the RAM one doesn't support updates because once the program has run, it's gone. Um, the database one supports updates. The RAM one is used by default if you don't do anything, so you get quick imports, just sort of one off if you want to try something. Um, if you use a slim mode, and I know it's a horrible way of naming that, but that's historical baggage, sorry, um, then you get the database import. There's also flat note files, which is sort of a variant of the database imports where some part of the data is stored on, on, on disk outside the database, which is faster. I'll read up about the details if, in, in the manual if you're interested. Um, and the raw data storage, uh, there's basically three tables that we generate. By default, they're called Planet OSM nodes and ways and relations, uh, rels. Um, and um, there's an old way, a legacy way, and a new way also of doing that. That's also pretty new. Um, and that the version we just released, 1.10.0, just released a few days ago, um, has now the final version of that new um, format. And um, uh, that changes uh, a lot and is, is, is going to be interesting for lots of use cases. So the, the legacy old format was a very weird format that we had to use because at that time when that was created, um, the Postgres database didn't support all the things it does now. Nowadays, we are using JSON uh, to store uh, tags and, and members, and that's much easier to use. Um, uh, the attributes, so the like timestamp, the version number, um, user ID, these kind of things, most people don't need that, but if you need that, OSM to PGSQL can store that for you. In the legacy format, they were stored as pseudo tags. In the new one, you get normal database columns, much easier to use and much smaller. Um, node tags were never stored in the legacy format. In the new format can store all OSM data. So you, you can finally create with OSM to PGSQL, you can create a database that has all OSM data exactly as it is in OSM and uh, then do something with it. Um, um, the legacy format, we al always said, this is an internal format, D don't rely on th this being that format and um, we, we reserve the right to change that. The new format, format is now documented and supported and we're gonna support that um, uh, into the future. And if you change something, there will be some flags or something, but um, uh, yeah. And uh, the new format is much smaller depending on exactly what you're doing, 8% to 35% smaller. Um, so um, that translates to many, many gigabytes, hundreds of gigabytes smaller in, in the worst case. Um, Currently, the legacy format is still the default, and you have to use the dash dash middle database format equals new um, to say you want to 
get the new one, um, but the old one will be phased out in the future. We'll only support the new one. Uh, probably the next version, we're gonna switch defaults and then at some point we'll um, get rid of the old one. Um, along with that, uh, a tip, re-import your database every once in a while. If, you, um, if you're doing updates, um, your database will degrade. We, we had uh, and the OSMF um, databases that OSMF is using for rendering, we looked at them recently and they hadn't been re-imported for several years and they were like twice as big as they should be. I mean, there's one, one issue is with, um, with Postgres database, they tend to degrade over time and there are ways to deal with that and you can do vacuuming. There's, there's a whole world of things you can do. Um, but um, in our case, it's sometimes just easier to get rid of the whole thing, do a new import. Um, so we, we get, get rid of the database, the bloating that the database creates. But there's also a new index format uh, that we introduced a few years ago, and this new middle format now, which make the database smaller. So um, you should probably um, uh, think about doing that if you. So and now um, the flex input, um, uh, the flex output. Uh, Paul is going to uh, talk about uh, how that works and uh, what to do with it. So my role these days is mainly in uh, using OSM to PG SQL, so making use of all of these features. Um, I don't write that much code in it these days. So the PG SQL output was um, mentioned earlier, and it's what we've had for 15 years or so. Uh, Flex is a new API for how to specify how, what you want to import into the database. Um, it brings advantages. It's, it's much easier to work with. Uh, in practice, it's easier to develop as well. Um, and everything's better with, faster with it. Uh, you need a recent version of OSMP to Beachy SQL, but you should have that for all the advantages earlier. It's, it works better. And the other advantage is, at some point we're probably gonna get rid of the PG SQL back end because it, we can't really fix any of the problems with it because it would break some uses. So there's a few resources I uh, just wanna point you at. The manual is a good one. There is also um, the flex config directory in OSM to PG SQL, which has a number of good examples. Some are instructional, some are things that you can just take that entire example and use. And there is a pull request on OpenStreetMap Cardo that shows not ideally designed, but a fairly complex use of Flex um, because OpenStreetMap Cardo is fairly complex. So these are good resources um, and I'll come to a couple more later on. So, the Flex API, what you do with OSM to PG SQL with both backends is you specify a script in Lua, a simple scripting language that uh, OSM to PG SQL calls for each object. Um, I'm not gonna go over the API in, for PG SQL because it's not a very good API, it's one that evolved over time. But in, with Flex, the general idea is that there is this global object provided and you define your tables, you define what you're going to process, and, and you, your function says what tables is this object going to be added to, and details like that. You can also have setup fun run functions on load and st stuff like that for general setup. So when you're doing this flex stuff, the first thing to do is, of course, create the tables. And the function to the, do that is, uh, define table or define some type of table. Um, the first one is what you would use most of the time unless you need to set do something more complicated. Um, since you can get you can do everything you can do with the first functions with define table, it just you have to specify more stuff. So looking at an example, this is, they're all very similar. Define known table. Uh, you name the table, you give it a list of columns, and then you can set, set some options. So this is equivalent to the dot .style file from the PGSQL backend, but it's more powerful, and it also lives in the same file as everything else, which is an advantage. 
So this is an example. Say you want restaurants that are nodes. You make a column with the name uh, as tags, a column with the tags as a JSON, and then a column uh, with the geometry as a point. So this will, when OSMTP is equal row, what runs this, it will result in it making a table in the database. And you save this because you're going to need it later. So there's a list of columns. You can define those a few ways. Um, you can have multiple geometry columns these days. That can be useful. Uh, you can have various types. See the documentation for the types. Most often they're just going to be text. But you can do JSON, you can do eight, you can do various data stores, or you could do store them as numbers. Depends what you're dealing with. Uh, you can also handle multiple projections. You could have one table with data in two projections in different columns, for example. Um, and it can integrate with pile expiry, which is something you care about if you're updating a map frequently. You can but use it besides the no function, you can also use a generic function. So this is an example. It's it's saying everything that the previous one did, that the name is restaurants, and instead of calling the defined node table, you say it's IDs or nodes and ID columns. See the documentation, but it will get you to the same point in this case. So you've got these tables that you're going to create. The next thing is how are you going to fill the tables? And the way OSM to PG SQL works is you define process functions, which are called for each object that um, is in the input data. So you process nodes, ways, and relations. Downside is you have to know what multi-polygons are. Come back to that a few times, but that's why my example was a node table. Those are much simpler. So this is, a, this is an example of handling nodes with the process node function. For each node that has tags in the input file, it will call this function. And then if it's a restaurant, it will, you've saved this restaurant object from earlier, so you call insert, and that inserts the table as you've, as you've specified, inserts an, a row into the table as specified here. This is, Obviously, a fairly simple example. Um, real world gets more complicated. And one of those complications is areas. Areas do not exist in the OpenStreetMap data model. You have to deal with closed ways, open ways, and multi polygon relations. So, this would be an example of how you do areas. It, you can see this throughout the examples. You have to. You have to check, is it an area? So I'm not defining that function in this slide because it has a lot of just constants in it and it would be too big for the slide, but it says, is this object, do the tags indicate this is an area or not? And if it is, then insert it as a polygon into this table. And then you also have to handle multi-polygons, which is what is done on the right. I'll get to some tools to make this a lot simpler later. Flex, though, is inherently more powerful in, because it can do stuff like geometry manipulation. Given this is spatial data, often we want to do something with geometry. So, for example, vector tiles need polygons turned into label points, which can also boost performance. You may want to split up a multi geometry into multiple single geometries. If you were using Mapnik, you would have to split up long, very long line strings for performance reasons. Or you might want to find what is the area of a polygon in this projection or this other projection. How long is it? That's all information that you might need. And the Flex backend kit has access to functions that will calculate those. So in this example, we're turning everything into points. So this is processing ways. So you're going to get ways that are areas. But, you're, but instead of inserting an area, you're probably just putting a restaurant icon and maybe some text there. You need a point. So we use what's called the pole of an accessibility, which is a reasonable point for using labels. Um, there's a, that's a complicated subject, but it's, it's a reasonable choice for that. So this will 
create a table that um, this will insert into a table points instead of polygons, and that you then no longer need to do that at tile generation time, it's done at import time, and that can often end up significantly faster. Now, with what I've described, there are some downsides, which is multiple tables gets messy. It's not bad defining them, so I've got two tables here, two node tables. The problem is processing, that you get, if this is a rest one, then do this. If this is a tree, then do this. These get, these get long because in the real world, complex style, they're probably gonna have about a dozen tables. And it gets worse once you start mixing in areas and relations. Um, OpenStreetMap Cardo is 714 lines of code. A lot of that is just a li list, so this tag indicates there's an area, that kind of stuff. This is still sim simpler than what it was in PG for the PG SQL backend. It turns out that dealing with all OpenStreetMap data in the going into the detail that OpenStreetMap Cardo does is inherently complex. It's doing a lot of stuff. But it's, it's still more complicated than it needs to be. There, and there's some other difficulties. So something that's often asked is, I've got this style and this other style. I want to put them both in the same database. Um, for That is possible. For example, I put nom and atom and a rendering database in the same database. Um, but it's difficult to do it, do it this way. And the functions get long and ugly. And there's other there's, there's, there's issues. And you write a lot of boilerplate. So the solution is a theme park. Theme park is built around the idea that most want, maps want to do some things different than other maps, but most things are probably the same. It's pure Lua, so it doesn't change OSM to PG SQL itself at all. Um, it's, it's new, uh, I think September? It's, not, it's quite new, uh, but it's very usable. I have written stuff in it and it works well. There's the website URL. So the idea behind theme parks is you have themes which implement tables. And then the theme park will take all of those, stitch it together, handle that really long function with all, if this, then do that, and if this, it, it will generate that for you. But it can do more because it will also generate simple vector tile configurations for both tile kiln and T-Rex and can do other things like generate tag info project files. We're open to adding more things like that, that you want to define all of these in one place instead of having it mixed, uh, mixed around files, which is a recipe for some of them getting out of date. If you can generate fr from where it's actually defined, you'll keep them up to date. So usage of it. Um, you need to clone it. It's, it's in beta. It's only available through Git. You need to add it so that it'll Lua and write themes. That's what the next slides are on. And then you use it just like an, any other uh, style. Say that you're using the flex output and you point it at the style. And it will then be able to pull the stuff in from theme park as needed. So the style looks like this. This is, you're saying you're using theme park, you're not debugging, and you're going to add these topics. These topics have tables in them. You'd add more than three, but it, this would just continue on. Where your logic goes is into writing topics. Um, so each topic has an init script. You can see the examples to see some examples. Often it's fairly empty, such as in this case. And then within each topic, you're going to find stuff by by adding um, ta so adding tables. So th this is no longer directly calling OSM to PG SQL. Instead, you're just telling Theme Park you want to set up a table in this way. The options are going to be basically the same, but this will create the error table. Then the real difference comes in in processing. You this you write it this function here that is specific to the topic that you're doing. And it will handle a lot of the stuff for you. So 
looking at this example here, fairly basic, but you're, you build it up and then you insert it. Or you could do areas as well. But the advantage is that you can take this code, it's in one file, you can write code for, say, restaurants, you can, that's in another file. And you can then can combine all of these together. And you could take, that, that also means that you could take work that someone else has done and use it for what you're doing much more easily. There are also a lot more tricks you can do. Uh, look at the examples. I've been working on a style called Street Spirit, which uses it. And um, those have some good examples. You can make a table with both polygons and labeling points. You can calculate them at an import time. You can selectively calculate them. Or you can combine multiple themes, which is something that a lot of people have asked for. Because if you're rendering multiple different maps, you, need, you don't really want to maintain multiple databases, multiple update streaming, and, and all that stuff. It's, it's nicer if you can get them all in one. So to combine multiple themes, you just add all the topics to one file. There are some things like it's your responsibility to make sure that you aren't trying to make two tables of the same name in the same schema, or that one is not club setting global variables that another is also trying to set. But these are pretty easy to meet. And there are other features. So you can integrate it with tile expiries, which uh, means that um, tile expiry indicates what tiles will need to be re-rendered. But another thing is this has all been talking about processing one object at a time. There's new stuff in OSM to PG SQL about generalization, and this will integrate into that, where you can handle more than one object at once. And I'll hand it back to Johan for this. Thank you, Paul. Generalization. So um, when you look at a map, uh, the OSM map here, uh, some, some random place, there's all this detail in there. Uh, like here, uh, every tree is mapped. Uh, and uh, when you zoom out, you can't show every tree, obviously. So you have to figure out what to show, what to not show, and what data to aggregate into larger things um, so it makes sense to show in uh, smaller zoom levels. And uh, that's basically what generalization is. Um, and um, so today, uh, we have lots of problems with not having generalization or sort of pretty simple generalization. So if you if you look at the OSM map today as it is um, in a specific, I don't know which zoom level that is, but that's how the United uh, the map of the United States looks. And then okay, so there's a few random cities. Okay, New York, Washington, Los Angeles. I can see, but why is there Phoenix on there and not Chicago and not San Francisco or something? So it's a bit weird the combinations of uh, of um, cities that, that we get here. So this is the job of generalization to figure out how to take all the detailed data that we have in OSM and show it on a lower scale um, uh, map. And um, a, the way we are thinking about this in, in uh, OSM to PG SQL is this, uh, again, we have the import um, from the OSM data. That's what OSM to PG SQL does. Then we have a database where the data is um, sitting, and we have some kind of process that um, uh, renders that into a map. So this is how normally all the, in some way, shape, or form, the, the, the rendering looks like, and there might be vector tiles involved or whatever, but this is sort of the general um, um, idea here. And um, when we look at the data processing that's happening here, on the import side, the context is, uh, Paul said, it's just this one object that you're looking at while you're importing the data. Maybe the ch children objects so far away, you can also look at the node locations, you, you need this. But, but this is very limited view that you have on the data. On the rendering side, um, you usually look at either the whole map or um, the tile that you want to render. And this is the data that you get out of the database and turn into a map. Um, the uh, processing the, the language that you're using to do that is Lua for the import, uh, as we have seen, uh, to specify what to import in, in what table and all that. And on the rendering side, it's SQL. Yeah, I mean, you have usually some kind of styling language or something 
but the stuff that actually in, um, connects to the database and um, gets out the right data that you need for rendering specific things, that's some kind of SQL that you need to write. Um, and we, in both cases, you have some, some time constraints. When we are doing updates, um, the import has to keep up with updates. So we have to, every minute, uh, ingest new data, and we have to keep up with that. Um, and on the rendering side, uh, the user might be waiting for the map. Uh, Maybe not, maybe it's a cached tile somewhere, uh, but in many use cases, the user clicked on something and the map is rendered for that specific user in that case. So it might be waiting. We can't uh, do a complex processing there. So the idea here, um, more, what we did is add a next, an extra um, a processing step. Um, uh, and it's, it's a program called OSMTP sql Gen, and it's part of the repository, so it's compiled with the rest and, and all that. But it's a different program. It reads the same config file as OSM to PG SQL, uh, but it, it's run separately. Um, and it has access to the database. It has access to through the config file to all the information, so it knows which tables you have and, and all these kind of things. Um, and it can read data from the database, process it in some way, and write it back to the database. Um, and so when we're looking at the data processing steps here, we have this in-between step um, that has access to all the data because it can access the database and everything is in there in some way. Um, the language in which we decide how to write that, uh, we can basically decide how to do that. We can use SQL and you do run SQL queries on that. And I, I mean, in a way, lots of people have been doing that in, in have some extra scripts they are running after OSM to PG SQL. Um, and we are now integrating this better. Um, uh, some of the code is written in C++, but I could also imagine that we have some kind of plugin system in the future that people could write their Python plugins or something to, to do that. And uh, with the time constraints, um, it's a lot different. We don't have really time constraints there anymore, not as much as we have them at the import and rendering step. It depends on exactly what you're doing. Uh, but we can do more complex processing. We can say, okay, let's do once a die, we're gonna do this more complex processing order, or uh, whatever it is. <coughs> so um, uh, in uh, the end of last year, beginning of this year, um, I did a, a project funded by the Prototype Fund. Um, it's a fund in, in Germany. Um, they uh, uh, yeah, help uh, open source projects um, to implement new features, and they've funded me for six months. To, to work on that. Um, and I implemented a framework um, and some generalization alg algorithms to get uh, all of that going. When, if you want to know more of the details, it's at that URL. Um, so some of the things that I implemented there is um, uh, a polygon generalization. Um, so you have lots of small polygons and you have to sort of decide uh, on smaller zoom levels, aggregating the bigger ones. Um, deriving built-up area, so an area where there's like lots of buildings and all that, you can't render each individual buildings when you zoom out, but you don't have to, but you want to maybe have a gray outline or so you see vaguely where the, the city is. Um, and uh, there's a place selection that I mentioned with the um, US map earlier. Um, so one of the things it can do and, and do quite quickly um, is uh, this merging and simplifying of polygons um, and this is all implemented in C++ using the OpenCV library, and it's really, really wicked fast. Normally, people use the SC buffer function in the database to do that. That's what we've been doing for years and years and years, and it turns out um, you can do it differently, and you can basically do it in real time. Um, and um, I just said that. And here again, that, that map of the US, and um, the algorithm that I implement is called discrete isolation. Um, there's a paper uh, on that and um, that's uh, I, I implemented that and then this is how the US map looks um, and uh, it looks a bit more sensible sort of the the cities that we decide here uh, the, to, to, to show here you and, and there's still um, you need configuration and there's lots of decisions that you have to make what you do to show and some of things are still strange and I have no idea what Lobog is um, and why it turns up here, but um, uh, yeah, so there's more work to be done uh, to 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 improve all these things. But there's a start there with the generalization. Um, you uh, configure it in Lua with the same config file as OSM to PG SQL is using, 
um, and it ties into the expire mechanism. So if something changes, it can automatically trigger the generalization for that thing. So um, it, it, it works. Here's an example uh, to um, uh, how the configuration looks like. It's not pretty interesting and uh, not so interesting. Um, I did a, a technology demo, a sort of proof of concept uh, to tie all of that together, uh, a minutely updated vector time map for the whole planet um, running on a reasonably sized server um, with generalization uh, for all the zoom levels. Um, and there's no caching involved or so. Um, and you can, you can try it out here. If you all try it out now at the same time, it's going to be slow. Um, because there is no caching involved. Everything, if you go on there, all the map rendering, everything happens while when you click on it. Um, and it's, it's minutely updated to all the zoom levels. Uh, there's only two exceptions. Coastline is only updated once a, once a day. And, um, and uh, what was the other thing? Water, what, um, uh, no, the, the street level, the low um, uh, streets um, for lower zoom levels are only updated sometimes. Because that's a more complex process and I couldn't figure out yet how to make that faster. Um, and it's not a finished map, it's not a product or anything. Um, this is not something you immediately want to use just uh, sort of to see where we are in the process of, of uh, improving all this and, and, and demonstrate that. Um, yeah, I um, talked about a lot about different things in, in OSM to PG SQL. I have to thank um, some of our sponsors, um, uh, Thunderforce, uh, Geofabric, uh, it's often given us uh, some money. The Foskis uh, EV, that's a, a nonprofit in, Germ in Germany, our local chapter, um, they are um, paying for the test server. Um, but there's obviously still lots of uh, volunteer and work, uh, volunteer work involved. Uh, Paul and I both do um, uh, consulting. Shameless plug here. So if you need anything about uh, done event OSM to PG SQL or OSM Dev stuff, um, talk to us. And uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, any questions? I'd also like to thank all the previous developers on OSM to PG SQL, some of whom are at the conference this weekend. Questions? The prompt here. Um, it's, I presume it's still not possible to import an OSM history file into uh, PGSQL with um, OSM PGSQL, like so that you could search by history? No, and you can't, you can't import an OSM history file. Um, that doesn't work. Um, if you want to do any kind of history processing, uh, create extracts for once a month or something, and then you can import them and do something with it. Uh, the, Question comes again and again. I would <laughs> love to do that, and I have some ideas, but it's not so easy to do that properly. Any other questions? No questions? Okay, then we can wrap it up for here. Thank you very much, Paul and Jochen. Thank you.